I'm Rebecca Harding and I'm a journalist. I'm here today with not just one, but two forensic psychiatrists. And we're going to be discussing the issue of defendants' mental health and um, their fitness to plead in court. Mental health has come to the forefront of the social agenda and awareness and attitudes have changed tremendously. Psychiatrists are having a growing role within the justice system. I'm here today with Dr. Andrew Isles, who's a consultant forensic psychiatrist and acts in both clinical and criminal justice settings. He led the mental health team at Brixton Prison, and he currently works for Surrey NHS and is responsible for the care of mentally disordered offenders who are both in the community and in secure hospitals. He also owns the firm Expert Court Reports. Dr. Stephen Attard is employed as a prison psychiatrist at Woodhill Prison, which holds Category A prisoners and operates a closed supervision centre for some of the country's most disruptive, challenging and dangerous prisoners. He completed his training in the high security environment of Broadmoor Hospital. He has also led both male and female psychiatric intensive care unit. So, hello, and how are you both? Are you good? I think, yeah, good, thanks. Good. good. Well, I have yeah. to say, it is slightly intimidating doing an interview with two psychiatrists. Like, I'm just going to try and keep my hands down, look normal, <laughs> and not do anything strange. And I won't tell you where I live, so <laughs> I should be fine. So, how did the concept of fitness to plead and stand trial evolve in UK law? Um, obviously, yeah, I mean, I suppose I can jump in. And um, I mean, the concept of fitness to plead generally, I suppose, is something that's existed for um, a very long time. I mean, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not that um, uh, kind of au fait with the, the kind of detail of the, the law, I suppose. But um, I mean, I think going you know all the way back to um, Aristotle's time, he was writing about how people shouldn't be held culpable for crimes if um, the decisions that they've made have been impacted by, by mental illness or kind of insanity, I guess, as it was um, thought of broadly in those days. And, and that carried on through Roman times um, as well. I mean, in, in this country, I think when we're looking at, you know, back in the kind of Saxon pre-Norman times, there was beginnings of the concept of um, whether people had the intention to commit a crime or not. And, and, and right. obviously that could be influenced and um, whether they were unwell or not. And if they were felt to be um, insane, then they were kind of released from custody to the, the care of their, their families. And then I think it was um, after the Norman invasion was when in this country we started having um, jury trials. Um, and at, at that point, um, you know, the, the kind of victim would accuse the, 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 the person in court and, and they would have to then enter a plea of whether they were guilty or, or not guilty. Um, and there became this concept of somebody, you know, whether, where somebody wasn't able to enter a plea. So they were yeah. um, uh, found to be kind of either mute by malice or mute by visitation of God. Um, and that was the big kind of question in court at that time, yeah. I guess, in terms of, of being fit to plead or not. Um, or if you were mute by malice, obviously you were either just not willing to say you did something or not, or um, uh, or you were kind of malingering. And the the way around it was um, was basically by loading people up with incredibly heavy weights until they changed their mind and decided to enter a plea or not, or or died. <laughs> so it was uh, always a good way fairly, to handle people. <laughs> it was fairly fairly harsh back in the day. Um, <laughs> And then obviously, if you were found mute by visitation of God, then that kind of implied that, that you weren't able to enter a plea. Um, and things evolved over time until um, the kind of famous case of, of, of Pritchard in, in the, the 1800s, I think it was 1836. And that's where the really the modern concept that we still use to this day um, originated in terms of fitness to plead. Um, so, so what did Pritchard say? What was the case? And um, what are the sort of but the way that you, you judge, how do you judge someone whether they're fit to plead or not? And what, what came out from Pritchard back in the day? So I just um, talk very yeah. briefly about what the case involved. Um, so the charge was one of bestiality um, and the defendant Pritchard, um, he was both deaf and dumb. So obviously it raised questions about whether or not he could um, plead, he could stand trial because of those impairments. So um, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? That it's 2021, and if you look at any psychiatric report um, that's been commissioned for fitness to plead, you'll see somewhere in there the name Pritchard, because Pritchard is still um, very much at the heart of what we understand about fitness to plead. So whilst there's been further case law, which has um, 
made clearer the terms and tests for fitness to plead, Pritchard is still central to it because it's the Pritchard criteria, which may have been clarified since, mm. but it's still the Pritchard criteria from that case, as Stephen said, back in 1836. So, so just roughly, what is the situation now for, you know, what, how does it stand um, for somebody like me who knows nothing about how you judge somebody and whether they're fit to plead? So, I mean, I suppose the first thing really to say is that um, it's not as straightforward as saying that if somebody has a certain mental disorder, that they will be unfit. So it's not as straightforward as that. Um, it is about the cognitive abilities of the person. So there are tests that a psychiatrist would do during a psychiatric assessment. Now, in medicine, we talk about things being like a bedside test. So things that are relatively um, straightforward to administer, things that we can do day to day in our practice. And that's the sort of level of assessment that happens as part of an overall psychiatric assessment when we're asked to assess somebody for fitness to plead. So there can be um, various mental disorders which might be present, which might compromise somebody's fitness to plead. But whether or not we say to the court that we consider that person is unfit to plead or fit to plead depends on their ability to perform any one of those cognitive functions. And there are about six in total um, and so that we don't um, all get bored with my voice, I'm happy for Stephen to talk <laughs> through them, or I can. Um, they they keep yeah. getting developed, really. They keep getting tweaked, and what we interpret each part of that test to mean gets tweaked. But maybe Stephen would like to do that, or I can if you... Well, I, can, no, I can certainly um, kind of yeah, go I was just yeah. going to say, um, and, and just picking up on one of, one of your points, Andrew, um, it is one of the really interesting things about... The concept of fitness to plead and it is, is over time um gradually become increasingly kind of intertwined with psychiatry and, it, and it's typically i mean often um other expert witnesses like psychologists for example will comment on fitness to plead but obviously they're still dealing with them um, kind of mental health disorders a lot of the time and um, but it is it, it, it does have to be a um psychiatrist that, that kind of give that recommendation to the court as it were and um, but but fitness to plead there's no kind of um explicit uh requirement for somebody to actually have a mental disorder in terms of them being found unfit to plead so it's not that's not within the test which is really interesting but it's, it's, it's just something that's yeah, built up kind of and, and become kind of entangled over time um, um and, and and that was particularly relevant i suppose because historically if you were found unfit to plead the only kind of outcome would be um, uh, a hospital order, so detention in a psychiatric hospital. And, and that used to happen at times, even if somebody was unfit to plead, for example, and um, because uh, they um, were um, kind of deaf and dumb in, in, in the kind of old parlance, I guess, and, and they might not have had a, a kind of mental disorder at all. I think that, that used to happen a lot in the 50s, didn't it? There's yeah. lots of cases and lots of books about that sort of thing. Exactly, exactly. Um, Looking or, or thinking about the kind of um, mm. Pritchard criteria as they're like operationalized, I guess, um, currently, th those are really, as Andrew was saying, again, they've been kind of tweaked and amended and changed over time. And that's one of the kind of complicated things about the Pritchard criteria. It's not like statute law, it's, it's common law that keeps evolving. So, um, you know, you'll find lots of different things written down in different places and it's hard to kind of <laughs> just keep up to, to yeah. make sure everybody's kind of singing off the same um, song sheet, as it were. Um, but the essential or core kind of, uh, re you know, requirements or, or tests currently are um, one is whether somebody's able to understand the, the, the charges that have been made against them and kind of the effect of those charges. Um, another one is uh, whether or not they're able to decide um, to enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. Um, so that's the second kind of major Kind of subhead making ability yeah themselves yeah yeah um or it's, it's i mean it's and it's, it's more about i suppose understanding the, the concept of entering that plea or saying you're guilty or, or, or not guilty um you've got to be able to um exercise the right to, to challenge a juror um although the kind of circumstances that you can do that i think are a bit more narrow than they used to be um you've got to be able to instruct your solicitor mm. um 
follow the course of proceedings so kind of follow the yeah. court hearing and, and, and what's happening in that and then um uh also um give evidence in your own defense as well so those are the kind of main um main headings um and there's kind of additional bits as again as time has gone on and it's you know, efforts have been made to to make it more of a, a functional assessment um, and and have it a little bit more in keeping with um, uh, kind of the concept of effective participation. There's been these other kind of subheadings that have um, you know been slotted in as, as things to consider, I guess, un underneath some of those. But those are the main kind of six um, six things that we get that we consider. And do you think that they're fair? Do you think they're at the right level? Or do you think the bar's too high, too low? Um, do you think the system's what system works? Well, I think, that think one of the, yeah, I think one of the problems is that largely it's quite subjective. So some um, jurisdictions, some other countries use scales and sort of questionnaires and structured assessments, mm. whereas this is subjective. It is down to clinical opinion. And um, I guess that from one individual to the other, the threshold may be different in their mind. I think that most people see it as having a fairly high bar. So you have to be really quite um, impaired in terms of the cognitive understanding of those right. yeah. six things to fall short of the Pritchard criteria. I mean, it's important to say that you don't have to fall short of all of them. If you fall down on one of them, um, then you are found to be unfit to plead. But what we should also just rec um, emphasize here is that it's not our decision to say someone is definitely unfit. We form an opinion right. and then it's for the court to accept whether the person is unfit. So you might have a situation whereby one psychiatrist, two psychiatrists say that a person is unfit, but the judge might not accept that. Does that happen often? Um, well, I don't know the data sort of nationally, um, but for example, in my own practice, it's happened a couple of times. So not very often, but it does happen. Yeah, um, absolutely. I suppose I've had a similar experience. Again, it's just kind of anecdotally, I guess, but um, mm. definitely on one or, or, or two occasions, um, you know, there's been at least two, I think, and then another occasion, three psychiatrists um, kind of agreeing in terms of somebody being unfit to plead, but then the, the judge has taken a different view. Um, and uh, and not not gone with that, and it's I, I guess just picking up on on Andrew's earlier points about um, whether it's a fair test as well. I guess one of the other things about the Pritchard criteria are that they really evolved with a lot of focus on cognitive ability right. or communication ability as well in terms of being able to actually you know That's say that nice. you're um, yeah and 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 kind of communicate whether you you're your plea. Um, so there's been less emphasis. Um, on uh, the impact of, of, of mental illness, for example, on, on somebody's decision-making capacity, and so actually you can you can um, you know have uh, fairly significant psychotic symptoms, you know delusions that might impact on your decision-making, um, but still be fit to plead um, in terms of the Pritchard criteria. So it's it's, it's quite interesting in, in that sense as well, and um, in terms of some of the Kind of changes that have been recommended um, over recent years. That's that's certainly one of them. Is to 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 move away um, to more um, or an assessment that's based more around um, kind of mental capacity. I guess. Yeah, I can I can see that. So I mean, if it moved that way, would there be a possibility that? somebody because everybody's a, um, a health advisor on google aren't they you can <laughs> you know everybody at the coffee shop will tell you what you're suffering from after five minutes searching online but do you do you think if somebody looked up the symptoms they could act out that for a psychiatrist do you, would you have the wool pulled over your eyes by somebody is that possible has it happened um you want I mean, to answer that though yeah, yeah, no, yeah, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> no one wants to admit this, do they? It's like, well, you could never do that. <laughs> I have to say, I think it's difficult to feign mental illness. Um, I have to say, um, you know, sometimes there are grey areas and sometimes doubt might be put into one's mind. But then I think that prompts sort of further investigation, um, further assessment. Sometimes, um, I'm not sure whether Stephen would agree, but 
certainly when we both worked in inpatient settings, um, if there was concern, you'd be looking really for a whole team approach to look for the validity of symptoms and um, whether those symptoms and signs were manifest in different settings um, and not the case that um, the nursing staff, for example, come to ward round and say, he only ever does that when you come to the ward to interview him. He's not like that at night. He might tell you he's not sleeping and he's hearing voices all night, but we find him asleep all night. Mm. Right. So, I mean, that's just it's a very simple example, but my yeah, point no, is, no. yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I, could, I completely agree. I mean, it's, I guess it's part and parcel to a degree of being a forensic psychiatrist in that there's, there's often, you know, more an element of secondary gain in potential for the patients that we see, perhaps, that, that, that people in, in, in general psychiatric practice um, might not do, because obviously a lot of the people that we see are, 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 are kind of um, tied up in the, in the criminal justice yeah. um, pathway at the same time. And um, so it's something that I think all forensic psychiatrists are attuned to in terms of the possibility. And, um, you know, in, in the context of doing court reports um, around fitness of pleads, as an example, I guess it's, it is harder than, than in that inpatient setting because we're only seeing them for potentially a one-off or, or you know, yeah. the most a, a two-off, um, you know, assessment over a couple of sessions. And I guess where we can't rely on that kind of 24-hour assessment uh, that you would do on an inpatient where it's, it's really difficult to kind of maintain um uh feigning symptoms. Period. yeah yeah i mean i suppose it it is um you know it's it's difficult for people to get an an accurate understanding from general information that's out there in terms of w what it is to be to have a mental disorder or a mental illness mm. um and also you know there's there's a lot of it's about kind of looking at the collateral information that you've got talking to other people and just trying to get that kind of rounded view as best you can um it's a holistic view it's not just that hour with that patient um, yeah yeah and it's important to know as well that questions about um truthfulness and fact obviously that ultimately is the um domain of the court so sometimes mm -hmm. um i'm sure stephen's done the same if there are discrepancies one can present those discrepancies in the psychiatric report, can almost put forward a couple of scenarios and almost guide the court to actually examine whether or not it's likely that the defendant would not know this or given right. fact A, B and C, that what he said in interview when it came to direct questions about fitness to plead, is that reasonable? You know, Is that likely that um, he wouldn't know that fact or that he wouldn't be able to do that so sometimes um you know you have to sort of allow the court really to form the judgment as to whether or not that's a likely um you know view or opinion or belief held by the person to then further inform fitness to plead so i think that actually the fact that it's not our decision wholly to decide whether or not someone's fit to plead is probably a really good thing because obviously the forum for um deciding whether uh something's truthful and um you know and is fact obviously rests with the court doesn't it no no that's really interesting so can you think of examples recently where um people have pleaded um unfit um you know or are unfit to plead are there any cases recently that um that you that you've seen or you could give examples of obviously not using client names <laughs> no of course yeah I mean, there are always lots of examples of people um, raising the question of fitness to plead, and it forms a lot of our instruction, doesn't it, Stephen, mm -hmm. in um, expert psychiatric practice. There have been, though, some high profile cases where the, um, you know, where questions about fitness or questions about mental disorder have been raised, um, and that's probably then swung the pendulum at times in favour of being, um, applying more scrutiny to fitness to plead decisions and then times when things have gone wrong in the other way and then it's maybe led to people having less of a high bar to determine whether someone is fit to plead or not um i mean one of the cases they talk about and it's not strictly about fitness to plead but um ernest saunders who was the um ceo of guinness the um you know the stout um, yeah. company um there was um allegations of um you know, really serious fraud. 
about sort of manipulating share prices at the point at which the company was going to be taken over during a, an aggressive sort of um, takeover bid. And um, with that particular case, um, he was um, found uh, to have dementia and um, after conviction had his sentence reduced on appeal. But then afterwards, then it was found that actually the cognitive problems that presented were actually part of um, a depressive disorder, which is not an uncommon thing to happen. Um, and there were real questions raised. And even though that was not about fitness to plead, anecdotally, we're told that the Crown Prosecution Service, for example, now feel that they almost had their fingers burnt there. So if ever um, an opinion is raised about someone being unfit because of dementia, um, often that will be robustly challenged um, to make sure that there's not going to be what was perceived as a miscarriage of justice or what was thought of as being a miscarriage of justice. So yeah. I think that there are some, aren't there Stephen, some sort of high profile cases which have sort of influenced it, which mm -hmm. might not have um, shaped case law, but certainly the sort of political landscape around fitness to plead has probably changed in response to those cases. Yeah, it just, it, I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds like it's very open to the manipulation of the press and, and as you say, politics as well, which really isn't justice, is it? But unfortunately, I think that's the way the justice system is influenced a lot of the time. Yeah. So how would you make any changes? Would you make any changes to the current system? Um, and what sort of, wh where do you think it should go in the future? I mean, I think um, the, the Law Commission produced a report. Um, they spent a, a number of years uh, kind of seeking opinion, I suppose, and um, produced a report back in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, you know, I'd, I find myself agreeing, I guess, uh, unsurprisingly, I suppose, with the, the, the recommendations that, that, that came out in that. And some of the, the primary ones were really around, um, uh, as I kind of mentioned before, I suppose, trying to, to, to really shift the test um, to something that is more based around um, capacity uh, and, and that decision-making model and something that's much more akin to the um, the kind of mental capacity act. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that is something that would be really important. We'll probably lower the bar in terms of um, um, unfitness because it is currently really quite high in terms of the, the, the Pritchard criteria. Right, what, what do you think, Andrew? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Um, actually, um, Stephen and I used to work at the same hospital and whilst we were there, that was when that um, commission, the Law Commission published that and it was out for consultation. And, and um, you know, and actually as well, one of our contemporaries, um, that's her PhD, is this area. Right. Um, yeah, Penny Brown um, uh, at the Institute of Psychiatry, which is um, sort of mental health part of um, King's College London. Right. So, yeah, I mean, there's active research going on about it, um, for sure. Um, and obviously, it's something which both um, clinicians and also legal professionals are obviously very interested in, um, because there is a perception that things do need to change, you know, not least because we're still citing case law from um, the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> but very English, I think. <laughs> Sorry. So if, if you were a barrister or a solicitor um, dealing with this um, or dealing with someone you, you want to help, um, what would your advice to them be if they're, they're coming up against this? About instructions or? Um... Yeah, yeah. So how, how would, what would your advice to them be in terms of approaching the issue and, and, and how to go about it? I mean, you must deal with a lot of solicitors and you must see things done well and things done badly. You know, what would you, what would you advise to them be? I have to say, not just in this area, but in lots of areas, I think that people who raise concerns about mental health outside of the mental health profession actually do it really quite well. So I think that solicitors often know which people need to have a fitness appeal assessment. Sometimes they can't quite articulate why, Sometimes they just have a feeling that they need to be seen. Sometimes they will know from the defendant or the defendant's family that there is a history of mental health problems or maybe some behavior that's peculiar. But generally, um, you know, other agencies are very good at it. So like prison officers, for example, are very good at spotting the people on the main wings that um, need mental health intervention. 
you know, the police are really good um, at spotting those problems um, when they come across someone in the street. So right. recognition, I think, is quite good. In terms of, um, you know, instructions, um, you know, lots of solicitors will just say, um, can you assess this man's fitness to plead? So they have an understanding um, of that term. You know, it's probably one of the most common instructions, really. Right. Um, yeah, but I suppose Stephen and I were talking about this earlier, actually, and Stephen mentioned, and I'll let him talk about this, that, you know, um, sometimes solicitors can be a little confused why we might not find someone unfit, because to them, it may seem like there are lots of factors which would indicate that the person was unfit. So I'll let Stephen say this, but the example he gave was about somebody with a psychotic illness. So someone like with schizophrenia or something who we might say is unfit, but I'll let, um, sorry, that we might say is fit. And then the solicitor questions why we say that and not unfit. Right. Yeah, no, I suppose, um, I mean, I guess it, it comes back to the kind of peculiarities, I suppose, of the, the, the Pritchard criteria and the, and the way that that's evolved over time. Um, but, but often, um, well, not often, but, but, but certainly not uncommonly, um, solicitors will kind of raise the query of fitness to plead in, 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 in an individual who, um, for example, might have schizophrenia and might, might be psychotic. Um, and, you know, if, if they have, for example, kind of um, uh, current delusional beliefs, um, you know, it, it, it may well be that um, they're perfectly able still to kind of uh, fulfill the criteria of the Pritchard, sorry, fulfill the um, Pritchard criteria so that they would be fit to plead, but on, on, on the surface, obviously, and, um, uh, you know, perhaps intuitively, even you'd, you'd, you'd assume that, that an individual like that wouldn't be able to, um, you know, effectively take part in, 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 in a trial and, and, and would be considered unfit to plead, but actually as things stand at the moment, um, they do um, they do meet the Pritchard criteria so it's it's um, you know it is uh, kind of a um, certainly an, an area that can lead to some confusion um, in, in, in terms of in instructors kind of uh, sorry solicitors kind of in, in instructing um, uh, us to, to, to carry out reports in, in, in that kind of situation um, and I think it is probably an area that you know as things shift to um, more of a capacity-based, or as and when they do shift to more of a capacity-based assessment, then, um, then you know perhaps things would change in that in that sense. Yeah, no, I can I can see that. Well, that that's been really interesting. I've learned a huge mm. amount from that, so thank you. So, um, if anybody want, has any questions for you and they want to get in touch, you're both um, you're both the expert court reports, aren't you? How do they yep. get in touch with you there, Andrew? Well, a um, few ways, I suppose. There's a website um, that's www.expertcourtreports.co.uk. There's a phone number, um, 01865 587 865, or, you know, an email, um, office at expertcourtreports.co.uk. So, yeah, any of those ways, really. That's probably yeah. the best way of getting a hold of either Stephen or me. Yeah, and, and what kind of work do you do? Have you, um, what's the sort of the range of the types of work? Because you've got quite a few of you working together, haven't you? Oh yeah, so it's quite a large panel. So mental health is part of it. So um, Stephen and I work alongside a number of other expert psychiatrists, but there are also psychologists. And then outside of the mental health domain, you know, um, orthopedic surgeons, um, dentists, plastic surgery, um, gastric surgery, um, some physicians as well, like pain physicians, anaesthetists, you know, there's, um, yeah, there's lots of different specialties. Some country of experts um, seem to be someone who can give expert evidence around, um, you know, financial markets and some other um, niche areas like that, social work. So, wow. yeah, you know, so, um, <laughs> you know, it's a mixed discipline. Yeah, panel, yeah. No, that sounds great. And obviously you're the best because, you know, you're here today. <laughs> so, no, that's great. Well, thanks ever so much for your time. And, um, and I hope everyone's found this as useful as I have. So thank you. Bye, thanks everyone. for having us, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah.